Hey y'all, it's Hannah and Jeremy, and we are embarking on our journey to Alaska. After a quick six hour flight, we landed in Seattle, making Washington state number 21 out of 50. After dropping our bags off at our hotel, check out that amazing view. We headed down to the pier to take the ride on the Bainbridge Ferry. The ferry is a great way to get views of the city from the Puget Sound. It is also relatively inexpensive compared to some of the harbor cruises that you can book. Honored with views of Mount Rainier. As the locals say, the mountain was out. For dinner, we headed to Pier 56 and enjoyed some local seafood dishes like crab dip, 
seafood risotto, and crab cakes. Elliot's also had some amazing views of the Olympic Peninsula. The next day, we made our way to Pike Place Market. The market has an amazing selection of produce, flowers, and fresh fish at the famous Pike Place Fish Market, where they throw the fish. We also had to stop at Beecher's Cheese. They are famous for their mac and cheese made from their flagship cheese, which is made right at the market. It's delicious, very reminiscent of a sharp cheddar. Next stop was the Starbucks Reserve Roastery. We did see the original Starbucks in Pike's Market, but they just serve a regular Starbucks menu. So we wanted to try the roastery for more options of the small batch specialty coffees.
for our pre-dinner drinks and appetizers, we headed to the Smith Tower. You start out with a tour of this historic 1914 skyscraper. Seeing some of the blueprints, the switchboard room, and even the mechanical equipment from the original elevators. Hello, yes, hello. One moment, please. We then made our way up to the 37th floor observatory, and despite the rain, we enjoyed some of the great views of the city. For our last stop, we headed to the Seattle Great Wheel. Although this is a very touristy location, it was a great way to kill some time before our dinner reservation while enjoying the view. Hey y'all, we are Hannah and Jeremy. On our second day in Seattle, we grabbed our rain jackets and strapped on our hiking boots and headed to Mount Rainier. We were in Seattle for a few days before our Alaskan cruise, so we wanted to make the most of it.
We debated about renting a car and driving ourselves, but instead decided to go with a tour company and we definitely think that we benefited from the knowledge and expertise of our tour guide, Ron. Seeing the mountain, right? We're going up to Mount Rainier. You've seen either the website or the brochures. You know, it's a beautiful mountain, wildflowers all around it, right? Today. No wildflowers this time of year. In fact, <laughs> we'll see snow. It'll be as high as the, as high as the bus. Um, some people have, the, the wildflowers are only out two weeks out of the year. We'll talk more about that later. But wow. 50 weeks out of the year, no wildflowers, right? But the brochures always show the wildflowers because mm -hmm. it's one of the most beautiful places on the planet, right? And I've had people come along and, and expect to see, in the middle of winter, with snow the size of the bus, expect to see wildflowers. Well, we're disappointed we didn't. Mm. specks of dark in it. Oh, that's the glaciers. That's the mountain right there. Okay, that's good. Good sign. So, cars began to come into the park in 1907. 60 cars that came in that year. Eugene Ricksecker is the guy's name who <laughs> designed the roads. So you could see all parts of the park from the road. It was the first time anyone in the United States could see a glacier, Nisqually Glacier. First time anyone in the United States could drive to a glacier, Nisqually Glacier. The national parks copied their building architecture from Mount Rainier. So when you see stones, river stones, this is from the river right next to us in the Squally River. We're going to be following it all the way up. You're going to see it in a minute. And the logs are from the trees. So this is really part, literally part of the park, but everybody else copied from right here. Hard to feel it squishy. Um, and then underneath the forest floor is the subfloor. Makes sense, subfloor. What about the layer in between the floor? And the... The ones I've talked about have spiny, right here, there's one. Spiky ears, okay, right here. Spiny, spiny, right? Cut the spines. They're Oregon grape. They literally grow something looks like it grows in a clump. Oh, we should talk about Ron reminded us on multiple occasions to mind the roots and mind the cars. You know, safety first. Makes me nervous though. <laughs> I'd rather not. Christine Falls, named after one of the daughters of one of the first climbers to successfully summit Mount Rainier, was one of our favorite spots on the tour. This waterfall is visible from the road year round, and during the summer, there is a lower falls overlook with additional views of the falls.
big, but that is the mountain. The Minge will have that kind of view at lunchtime. We're going to get up to uh, lunch. For lunch, we made our way to the highest point accessible in the park during the month of June, the Paradise Inn. Although the visitor center and the inn were both open, the Paradise area still had over 100 feet of snowpack. I'd say that's a pretty good explanation of why we didn't see any wildflowers. Mountains on our left, in the fog. Fog is a cloud, that's a low cloud, it's fog, but that's the mountain. Melting clearly. <laughs> okay. Can I walk on? No, you're gonna fall and break your ass. We did not let the increasingly heavy rain interfere with the rest of our afternoon, stopping at the Nisqually Glacier Bridge and Carter Falls. Although you can no longer see the Nisqually Glacier from the bridge, it is still a stunning view back at the mountain, even on a foggy day. I guess they're growing enough at this point that the boulders were bump against the bottom of the bridge. Not quite high from side to side, it doesn't quite feel quite that full, but enough for the boulders get up bumping the bridge. Stay tuned for the next video where we sail out of Seattle and on to Alaska. Although the trip did not end as planned, we still have some amazing things that we can't wait to share with you. We booked the seven night round trip inside passage from Seattle with stops in Glacier Bay, Juneau, Skagway, and Victoria. Originally, our trip did include Ketchikan, but we'll get to that.
We had initially booked a balcony, but at the last minute decided to upgrade to a mini suite because how many times are you really going to take this once in a lifetime trip to Alaska? Now you may or may not have heard that the Crown Princess was having some engine troubles this year, and the ports had to be adjusted. A few months prior to our trip, they let us know that Ketchikan was going to be replaced by a short stop in Icy Strait Point, and our day in Juneau was shortened by about half. But about two weeks before the trip, they removed Icy Strait Point altogether. All of these changes were due to engine and generator problems, which Princess called scheduled maintenance. But with supply chain issues all around the world, I wouldn't find it hard to believe that they were having trouble getting parts. The only thing we noticed was the rattling and shaking towards the back of the ship, which reminded you of these issues. We set out to make the best of our trip and enjoyed the best that Alaska has to offer. Our journey began with a sea day, which we spent exploring the ship, enjoying the views, and enjoying afternoon tea in the main dining room with the perfect amount of little tea sandwiches, sweets, and scones.
We had dinner at Sabatini's that evening, but I didn't bring the camera, so you'll have to trust that it was delicious. On the day the ship was arriving in Juneau, the weather was moody at best, starting out pretty sunny, and then towards the afternoon, low clouds and misty rain rolled in. This was our first taste of the famous Alaskan rainy weather. We were greeted with some views of sea life, which we were pretty sure were dolphins. y'all it's hannah and jeremy and on last week's video we set sail to alaska we showed you all around the crown princess and talked about the port changes and the issue the crown is facing this season This week we pull into the first port of Juneau and finally step foot in Alaska, our 22nd state. As we mentioned last week, our time in Juneau was reduced by about half, so many excursions were canceled or had their trips shortened. So we were going to get off at the port and see what options we had. We knew we definitely wanted to see the Mendenhall Glacier and ride the Mount Roberts Tram. Captain had announced that we made good time and arrived an hour earlier than expected, so we booked our tickets on the Glacier Express and took the bus out to the glacier. This was honestly the best way to do it, because if you book a tour with set times, your time is limited and you might not be able to complete the hike. Once we get past all the diamond stores and everything else here, the old part of town folks is straight ahead. The Red Dog Saloon stays open year-round. That's one of the most unique places in town. The Mendenhall Glacier is over 12 miles long and a mile and a half wide at the face of it. 
The glacier has retreated over a mile since the 1920s, creating the lake seen from the visitor center. The glacier ice appears blue because over the years, snowfall has compacted, squeezing the air out and creating large ice crystals that reflect the blue light. The longer the path light travels in the ice, the more blue it appears. Despite the rainy weather, we persisted and completed the two-mile hike to Nugget Falls. The falls were pretty powerful and thunderous and absolutely worth suffering through the weather. It's a really good thing we had those boots and rain jackets. When we got back to the port area in Juneau, we boarded the Mount Roberts tram. The tram uses the cable system commonly found in the European Alps, and the ride lasts six minutes each way and takes you over 1,800 feet above the port to the edge of the Alaskan rainforest on the top of the mountain. There are hiking trails at the top with what I'm sure are gorgeous views. However, our views were of mostly fog. We were both pretty tired by this point and didn't do too much exploring, but we definitely enjoyed the unique perspective of the port.
it's Hannah and Jeremy. And if you saw our last video, you know that we had to be quarantined on our Alaskan cruise. The morning we docked in Skagway, we spent the day resting and enjoying what we could see from our balcony. of Skagway, we headed towards Glacier Bay. The next morning as we entered the National Park, we were blessed by some of the whale sightings, setting the tone for an unbelievable day. As part of the partnership that the cruise lines have with the National Park Service, park rangers come on board the ship very early in the day to guide us through Glacier Bay and to share their vast knowledge of the park. I'm going to let Ranger Billy tell us all about our cruise through Glacier Bay. You should see two maps, one of the overall view of the park and all its 3.3 million acre glory and a smaller zoomed in version on the right that shows our journey today. We'll focus on that zoomed in version. Your ship started this morning in Icy Strait at the bottom of your map. I started my morning this morning at 5 a.m. at park headquarters near where it says visitor center. My coworkers and I caught a ride with a park service transfer vessel and climbed on board your ship in Sataka Day Narrows. Some of you early risers might have seen us this morning, but if not, there'll be another chance to see us off this afternoon. My fellow rangers and I like to say that the best place to see the glaciers and the wildlife is not the right side or the left side, but outside. If you do cho choose to go outside, Monkey Island is open at this time, and that can be a great place to see the glaciers. We like to say that wildlife viewing is a team sport, and often uh, myself up here on the bridge or other parts of the ship, we don't always get to see can always see the same wildlife that you can from your vantage point. So again, if you see some wildlife, I know some folks have already seen whales and sea otters as we've been coming up bay today. Um, so if you see any of those 
make a new friend and point it out to the rest of us and we're all gonna get to enjoy a spectacular Glacier Bay day together here today. But Glacier Bay has not always looked like this. Centuries ago, the lower bay was not water, but land, with spruce trees for canoes and plenty of wildlife for hunting. Around 250 years ago, the Grand Pacific Glacier surged forward very quickly and forced the Clinket to abandon their villages and flee their homes here. The Clinket escaped and built new homes for themselves across Icy Strait in the village of Huna, where they still live today. The Clinket are a resilient people and they returned to Glacier Bay once that glacier receded, and they are still here today. Their name for Glacier Bay is Siddhiti Geyi, or the bay and place of the glacier. Most of you probably associate the name John Muir with Yosemite, which he was partially responsible for saving as a national park. But in 1879, he was a young, little-known naturalist who had a theory that the amazing geography of Yosemite had been formed by ice, by glaciers. In California, he was thought he was crazy. Once people started reading John Muir's articles about Glacier Bay, both tourists and scientists started coming here in the 1880s to see the wonders of this place. One of those scientists was Harry Fielding Reed, a geologist who worked with John Muir to study the glaciers here. Reed and Muir even built a cabin together at Muir Glacier to serve as a makeshift laboratory and home base for their future studies here. Reed Glacier on our left is the first tidewater glacier of the day. It's three quarters of a mile wide 150 feet high at the face, and it's nine miles away from its origin up in the Brady Ice Field, high in the mountains above us. At this point on our cruise today, you may be saying, Ranger Billy, we've come all this way and you haven't even talked about glaciers yet. What is a glacier anyway? Well, I'm glad you asked. I like to think of glaciers as rivers of ice. Most of us know how streams and rivers work water follows the path of least resistance, going downhill with gravity. Glaciers work the same way, only with snow and ice. When more snow falls in the mountains than can melt during the summer, it compresses and form becomes solid ice. All of that ice has to have somewhere to go, and gravity pulls it downward and causes it to flow just like a river. Glaciers can grind down just about anything in their path chewing up the sides of mountains as they go, like giant bulldozers. That's why the glaciers sometimes look dirty or have gravel and rocks in them, because they're carrying debris from the mountains they just chewed up. This summer, Glacier Bay National Park is anticipating 600,000 visitors. In most national parks, that number would bring with it a lot of challenges. How do you provide lodging, food, roads, and services to all of those people who want to come see your park? But of course in Glacier Bay, 95% of those visitors will be arriving via cruise ships like yours. A maximum of two cruise ships per day are allowed in Glacier Bay to lessen the impact of tourism on the park's wilderness. Very few people actually set foot on the land, which minimizes the impacts on the landscape.
approaching Marjorie Glacier on our port side and the Grand Pacific Glacier straight ahead. And most people think of the blue pillars of Marjorie as being the most beautiful. And she is at one mile wide, 20 miles long, and 250 feet tall. That's as tall as a 25 story building. And that's only above the water. There's another 100 feet of ice below the water line. Our ship today is about 150 feet tall from the water line to the top of the smokestacks. So that means that the Marjorie Glacier is going to be about 10 stories taller than our ship. A lot of people think of Marjorie as the more photogenic of the two glaciers, with her blue ice and her more frequent calving. But I like to think of the Grand Pacific at one mile wide, 22 miles long, and 150 feet high straight ahead of us as the most impressive. That dark mass in front of us, coming down from Canada, that looks like a lot of dirt and gravel now, once stood 4,000 feet tall and covered all of Glacier Bay, 65 miles of ice running south to Icy Strait. It's the same one that drove the Clinket out of their homeland, and the same one Captain Cook saw that had all of the bay locked up in ice. This calving that we saw today is triggered in a tidewater glacier through interactions between the ice and relatively warmer salt water. The blue ice that we saw could be 200 years old, falling as a snowflake back when the United States was still a young country. It has been a pleasure today to take you on a trip through time, through a place that on first glance may seem like a vast, unpeopled wilderness, but on further investigation has a wealth of stories to share about the people that have come before us and are still here today. Glacier Bay is a place that provides sustenance and nourishment to people and animals, and a place that inspires awe in all who are fortunate enough to visit here. I'd like to leave you with today with a quote from Septima Collis. She was one of those travelers here in the 1880s, and she came back home and wrote her daughter about her Alaska cruise. After seeing these glaciers that you saw today, she said, No camera, no pencil, no vocabulary can do more than produce a desire to see it for oneself. I can only say that it has been my fortune to behold much that is grand in nature, at home and abroad, but the hours spent at the glaciers made the great event of my life. If God spares me, I hope to see it often. My hope for all of you is that seeing the glaciers today has been a great event in your life and that you may see them again someday. Thank you to the captain and crew, and I wish you all fair winds and following seas.